So at this point, we know um, most of what we need to know in terms of segmentation, right? So we've seen the exact format of the segment descriptors. Uh, we see that it's got a 20-bit limit, 32-bit base. And then we've got other things like this L, which we don't care about, which is 64-bit. ABL, that just means available. It's not used anything right now. But if you want to have some custom software property, you can go ahead and do that, as opposed to sometimes when it says, like, this is hard-coded to zero. It says AVL. You can use it for whatever you want if your operating system needs a bit in the descriptors. Um, DB, we said that was about, you know, do, do all operations inside the segment, are they considered 16-bit versus 32-bit? Uh, DPL, descriptor privilege level, you know, is this a uh, ring 0, ring 1, ring 2 thing? Granularity, that had to do with the limit. We said granularity is 0, the limit is in bytes, granularity is 1, the limit is in 4 kilobyte chunks. And therefore you can cover all of memory, all 32-bit space anyways, with one big segment. And that was pretty much everything. Oh, system and type. So there's system. So you've got a bunch of different types of system descriptors and a bunch of different types of uh, code or data. And the type helps you figure that out. So we saw the uh, code and data ones. And then system has a bunch of stuff we don't know yet other than LDT. So if I remember it, we'll come back to that later. And I didn't look up any of the stuff that great. So. All right, so we're on to the lab. And so I had found a Windabug plugin from this link. And I think it was already printing out um, IDT, GDT. Well, maybe it was just GDT and LDT. It may have done IDT. I don't remember. But I modified it for this class so that it prints out all sorts of information that we want. And this is a much nicer plugin. And so for this lab, we need to uh, get cozy with WinDebug. We're going to do some kernel debugging because we're going to actually get into the kernel because that's where we have to be, obviously, in order to look at some question or just touch it. Okay. All right. So this slide is for your own purposes. The key points here is that what we're going to do is we're going to start the VM and we're going to connect to it with the kernel debugger. There's a little bit of a timing issue here. Ideally, we want it to be the case that we start the VM, it creates a virtual serial port, and then the kernel debugger connects to that virtual serial port, which is actually just a named pipe on the host. And so you have to start the VM first in order for VM to create the, the virtual serial port. And then you start WinDebug so that it can talk on the virtual serial port. And then when the VM boots, it talks and says out, hey, is any debugger there? Hey, is any debugger there? And then you want uh, WinDebug waiting at that point. So on your desktop, you should have a uh, VMware player thing. Yes, question. So the same technique works similarly if you have a physical machine with a serial cable? Yep, but you'll have to. You'll have to configure it differently. But I believe there is. Only, I don't have a configuration for a physical serial cable, but I do have hardware listed on because you don't want to be using physical serial cable. Open up VMware. Click on Intermediate x86 Class 2. And then edit the virtual settings. You're going to go to Add. And you're going to add a serial port. All right. And then when you click Next, you get the next screen where you want to say that the serial port should be output to a named pipe. And go ahead and click Next. And we want to name that named pipe. Well, let me see what I put in my slides. dot dot slash or slash slash dot slash pipe whatever and then you want to say that the other end is an application and this end is a server right so everyone should have slash slash dot slash pipe slash whatever this end is a server the other end is an application you connect on power on. all right hit finish but then before you go you have to click this little checkbox which becomes available yield CPU on pole so that uh, lets the debugger uh, interrupt the system. All right, so you should have something that looks like this right now. Connect on, power on, username pipe, slash slash dot slash whatever, or pipe slash whatever. This end is server, this uh, other end is an application. Go ahead and hit OK on that. And then before we start this up, we want to get WinDebug ready to go. 
I was having some problems with this in the other class, so we may, if, if other people are having problems, we'll just uh, do this the other way. So open up Windabug. It should either be, yeah, it looks like it's not on your desktop. Go to All Programs and Debugging Tools for Windows. And then Windabug. All Programs, Debugging Tools for Windows, Windabug. When you get into it, you're going to go to File, and Kernel Debug. And then we want the slash slash dot slash pipe whatever. We want the pipe checkbox click. So we'll make sure we're all synchronized at this point, and then uh, we'll continue on. Right, yep, we need that. We need that slash slash dot slash pipe slash malware. Don't forget open there. Okay. Anyone on the phone uh, following along want me to wait at all? Okay, who wants me to type this? Alright. I'll wait just a second here. Eat my uh, cookie lunch. <coughs> Yep. So at this point, we're going to play the virtual machine, and it'll have 30 seconds. It's counting down for whether you want to accept this initial boot thing. While it's sitting here counting down, over in Windabug, go ahead and hit OK for the kernel debugging. And then Windabug will now be sitting there saying, okay, I'm waiting for someone to talk to me on the virtual serial port. You can either hit return or just let this count down from its 30 seconds. Enable the debugging. Click in and press return. And if it succeeds, which doesn't look like it's been online. Yep. This is what was happening with other people in other classes. Oh, awesome, yeah. So Windabug crashed. Did anyone have Windabug just shut down on you like I just had? Yes, we got one. All right. So the alternative way that we can do this is we can just let the thing start booting and asking for Windabug, and then we'll open up Windabug at that point. So for anyone who has a crash, anyone who's following along as well, if Windabug just stopped on you, I think this is, um, I feel like this is a VMware player issue because I've never seen this outside of these labs. Just go ahead and power and uh, shut power off the uh, virtual machine, power, power off VM. And so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to get Windabug ready to go, but I'm not going to hit OK until we start the VM. So if it crashed, go again to start all programs, debugging tools for Windows, Windabug, go to file, kernel debug, and then just let it sit there. And let me think. Which way am I doing this? Yeah. So now, instead I'm just going to say play virtual machine. I'm going to let it boot up and I'm going to, uh, Matt, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to hit OK and let this thing boot and then hit OK and win the boot. All right, so I'm going to say let it boot, start Windows normally, break out, hit OK, and then there we go. This time it's caught it. How about you? Did that work for you? All right, so this should let your uh, Windows VM should boot up, as you see here. Don't, don't worry about the formatting for now. Hold on. We'll set up common formatting in a second. All right, so you should now have Windabug. It should have had some number, some number of whatever warnings and stuff. You may or may not have it, like, expanded to this entire window. So you may have, like, a separate window here and this gray window there. So this is where we talk about we're going to be all on the same page for formatting. So all along, you want to take your main window and you're going to drag it around. Now, if you drag it over itself, then nothing's going to happen. But if you drag it over this gray, then you should see it expand to fill up this entire window. So now you should have a command window, which is expanded to fill up the entire window. You'll have the little uh, icon bar at the top. And the command window will be taking the entire window. All right, so has everyone in here got that already? Yeah, good. Anyone on the phone still waiting on the 
not have this thing completely filling. Okay, Dave, you have his ears connected, or is it just uh, not the filling that we're doing? Okay, so in your case, if, if it didn't work, I'm going to do this again. I'm just going to close my window bug. If VMware player is up, just go ahead and, you know, hard shut it down. It shouldn't really matter. Power, power the thing off. <coughs> the VMs are disposable. All right, so what you want to do is have the thing ready. You're going to open up WinDebug. And you're going to go to File, Kernel Debug. And make sure you have slash slash, dot slash, pipe slash, whatever. And the same thing in your, you know, edit your settings on your VM side. Look at your serial port and make sure you have slash slash, dot slash, pipe slash, whatever. This end is server, other end is application, field on CPU pool. All right. And so now what you want to do, though, is just like boot the uh, VM entirely. But right after you've let it boot, that's when you're going to hit OK in, in the bug. So like this, you get to the boot screen. So if you want to boot debugging, it's counting down. You say, yes, go ahead and boot debugging. And then you jump out of the VM, go back to win debug, and hit OK. And then point is, the VM will be polling on this virtual serial port on boot. It'll be saying, like, okay, is anyone there? Is anyone there? Is anyone there? And then it should be able to connect. So, give you one sec, and then let me know if that works. Yeah, essentially, if you're waiting more than, you know, a couple seconds, it's not going to connect. So, at the next break, which will be in about uh, 40 minutes or so, then I'll... Uh, try to log on to the same one as you, although I don't think that ever works, but to figure out something, uh, we'll maybe have you do like meeting place to share your screen to me or something and then we'll check it out. All right. So you can just uh, watch for now and we'll have you go through it later. All right. So the point is when we get to here and we have the command window taking up the entire screen, we're going to start uh, splitting this up so that we have useful information displayed at all times. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to mouse over this little one that looks like a bunch of lines called memory window or hit Alt 5. And if you do that, you should get a floaty memory window. But now what we want to do is we want to drag it, roughly speaking, towards the top middle of that command window. And it should split the window horizontally, right? You want to see your window split horizontally like this by dragging it to the top. Again, remember, if you're, you know, if you're just dragging over yourself, nothing's going to happen. You may have to move it off to the side and then move it back to the top middle to get it split. All right. Then after that, right next to it, to the left, the little one with like an AX on it. This is the register windows. So you can hit Alt 4. Pull that up. And we're going to drop that over here to the, um, to the right of that memory window. So we're going to split the memory window so that it's half-half. And we're actually going to pull this all the way over so that it goes to the minimum size because our register values are not that big. We don't need all that screen real estate. All right, so that's fine for now. So you should have memory window, register window, and one big command window at the bottom. And then finally, we're going to split that command window. And we're going to find the disassembly window, which is Alt-7, or this little thing with a 1.0 on it. We'll mouse over till you find the disassembly window and drag that thing to the bottom right. And so now you should have sort of a four-way split here. Command window, bottom left. Disassembly window, bottom right. Memory at the top. Registers at the top right. And so just for your own purposes, uh, you can overlap windows completely and get tab browsing. So if I want to pull up, if I want to see two different windows of memory at once, I go ahead and hit another memory window. It'll go up, come up wherever it is. But I can drag that the middle of the other memory window. It will completely overlap. And now I can, you know, tab between these. If I want to see the call stack, which you don't really care about right now, but if I wanted to, I'd, you know, overlap that as well. So I can see memory, and I can go to calls, and I can go to local variables as well. So you work with whatever, uh, when you do this yourself, work with whatever arrangement suits you. But for class purposes, we're using mine. All right, everyone, okay. Question, is it possible to use another VM to run the window? The answer is yes. Um, I think that little slide there had a quick description of it. It typically is a little more hit or miss. 
it took me a long time to get the stupid thing to work the first time when I was dealing with like VMware Server on Linux. But I do have configuration examples for like VMware Server 1.x VM to VM for Linux or Windows up on the wiki. And I do have it working myself for VMware Fusion on my Mac. But I was never able to get it to work on virtual box on my Mac. Because obviously I can't debug from my host system to my guest system on my Mac. So I need to do one VM to one VM. Never got it working on virtual box. Not to say it's not possible, but uh, the instructions are up for if you want to. If you're on Linux, obviously, again, same point. You've got to go from one VM to the other VM. All right, so everyone here, we're at this point right now. Everyone on the phone, you all have your uh, thing split four ways. You to sound off from everybody quick? Okay, I guess we got to customize the registers quick. Um, back in Windabug, just for simplicity purpose, click on registers and customize. This little button up there, oh, yeah. not known yet. You have to break into the debugger. So go to debug window, uh, debug menu, and break. Now it's going to, you know, stop the system, let you inspect memory, etc. But we don't want this sort of random assortment of variables. Well, our registers over here. We want to customize it. And so let's go ahead and I'm I'm just going to go like EAX, EBX, ECX. EDX, right? So ABCD. I'm going to go EDI, ESI. And so you can just like copy whatever's at the beginning. If there's duplicates in this list, it doesn't matter. It'll just only show one of them. So just get your general purpose registers, EAX through EDX, EDI, ESI, EBP, ESP. And then just for whatever, we'll do CS, SS, DS, ES, SS, DS. All that good enough. All right, so A through B, so EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, uh, EDI, ESI, EBP, ESP, and then your segment register, CS, SS, ES, ES, FS, GS. All right, so everyone's got that. If you want, I don't ever really use it in this one, but certainly if you want, you click this display of modified registers first. That means if you step one instruction, whatever's changed will show up in red at the top of your registers. With so sometimes that is useful. I usually just get all the registers I want where I can see them, and then I can just do whatever's red. So there we go. Got everything in order at the top, and it all fits in place. We even got E flags on there. All right. So right now, what we're going to do is. Well, I'm even going to say, just for our purposes, since we don't really care about eFlags or EIP here, let's go ahead and put in uh, GDTR after the GS, so that we can like just look at the GDTR. And then in WinDebug, it takes the GDT limit, the 16-bit uh, portion, and it calls it that, like it's a different register. We know that GDT register is really 48 bits wide. But for convenience, WinDebug gives you GDTR, which is the 32-bit base address and GDTL, which is the limit. So we can do GDTL space. And then now when you hit OK, you'll see that, OK, my GDT is based at 8003F000. And my GDTL is 3FFFF, which is 20 bits worth of the focus. That's 19 bits worth of one. Two for the three. And then 16. Right? So it is not using the maximum GDT size for what it's worth. All right. So the point of this lab, the point of why we're getting into the debugger right now, is we want to go look at the GDT, look at those GDT descriptors in detail, look at the I, well, not IDT yet, look at the LDT and prove that it's not there. Right? So I said I made a custom plugin for this. We're going to go. Compile it in Visual Studio, and as a post compile action, it like copies it into the WinDebug folder for you. Make it easy. So in Visual Studio, pull that up and mark prop mode XSK as your startup project. Prop mode for like protected mode, I guess. Protected mode XSK because I modified it. 
uh, as the startup project. It should go bold and all that. And then just go ahead and right click on it and hit build. <coughs> the very top option. All right, so it should say build succeeded. Did anyone have their build not succeed? Did anyone see a failure in that output window below? I guess some of your windows are a bit, didn't come into a good state when you started. Okay, so you may have to clean it and then um, build it again. So we'll just hit the rebuild. So just to make sure, right click on it and go to rebuild. That's going to clean and build. So it'll dump away all the existing files and run it again. And then, yeah, you're right. And then it'll run the post build event. Doing the compilation within the uh, VM. This is compilation outside of the VM at the moment because we want our wind debug to have the plugin and we're wind debugging from outside the VM. Yes, this is outside the VM compilation. Okay, and Lily said my environment is still configuring for the first time using. You probably oh, is that is that a um, Visual Studio warning that you're getting there, Lily? Yeah, that's just from Visual Studio running the first time. I'm sorry, where, where's the code that I'm compiling? Um, you'll have to download. Yeah, I, I have that on my desktop. Okay, so you got that on your desktop. From there on the desktop, you click the .sln solution file, right? And it's just configuring now. Right? Okay. And so once it's uh, done configuring, what you're going to do is you're going to right click on Prot Mode XSK. And you're going to set as start a project, as I'm currently showing on the screen. And then after you've done that, you're going to again right click on Prot Mode XSK and then click on Rebuild. And then it'll just compile it outside of your virtualization so that the plugin is available to Windabug. So ping me again in a second if that doesn't work. x86.sln that we're clicking? Yes, the intermediate x86.sln. Like, um, so it's in, in, in the overall intermediate x86 folder, there's intermediate x86 code, and then in that there's intermediate x86sln. And once Visual Studio is done configuring and stuff like that, you'll see uh, You'll see that all of these projects, and you just have to right click on Prot Mode SK and then set a startup project, and then right click again and click rebuild. All right, anyone else still waiting on the, uh, anyone else has not gotten to the rebuild Prot Mode XSK yet? All right, and I'm going to continue on. Well, after you've successfully built and it's copied this DLL, which is a Windabug plugin, they'll copy the DLL over to the Windabug plugins folder. And so going back to Windabug, in the command window, you issue dot load space quote load. Capitalization doesn't matter. Question? In Windabug in the command window. Oh yeah, sorry, that's a bottom there. Yes. Yep. Dot load. Oh. Period load. Space quote load. You press return. If it succeeds, you should see nothing. And then hit bang or exclamation point descriptor. And you should be able to tab complete descriptor at this point. So type uh, exclamation point DE tab. And then if you can successfully tab complete descriptor, it means the thing's installed. All right. Got it. Good. And just go ahead and hit return after that. And just return on the empty descriptor. This will show you the syntax. All right. So what you're going to see in here is a bunch of uh, commands for a descriptor. It takes things like descriptor and then IDT and then information about IDT. We don't know about IDT yet. We learn it later. <coughs> I should have reordered and nice this so that IDT was at the bottom. Crazy. So bang descriptor GDT and then you give it a descriptor index in hex. So index starts at zero. So if you give it bang GDT zero, uh, you should see something about it's invalid. 
Wing descriptor, capital G T space zero. It's going to say, you know, yeah, it's zero, it's zero. I guess it doesn't really say it's invalid, but it is invalid. It's, by, it's just something in the spec that GDT of zero is never used. Okay. And I assume that's so that you don't have segment selectors being zero or something like that. So uh, another thing you can do, a more useful thing for now, is bang descriptor dump GDT types. So this goes through and it walks every single index and it pulls out the type information, right? It says system type or non-system type, and then it does the type. So you bang descriptor GDT underscore, no, sorry, dump underscore GDT underscore types. You press return, it's going to walk through all of the GDT entries. And if we walk up here again to the beginning, what we see is uh, descriptor zero, empty descriptor, not supposed to be used. GDT of one is 32 bits, so that DB field was set to one. It's ring zero, so here we're saying the DPL was the descriptor privilege level was set to zero. It's code because the system type is set to zero, and so the code, so it's set to one, meaning code or data, and then it goes and it looks in the code, the type field after it sees that it's code or data, and we had that table where, you know, one, the first pieces were all data and the second pieces were all code, right? So it went down and it took those last three bits from the type field. It says, for these three bits, this is considered code, execute, read, and it has been accessed this far. And typically the accessed stuff is just automatically set by uh, the hardware. It'll, it'll take, if you may set something as execute, read, but if the hardware ever accesses it, it says, okay, I need to mark that as access now. Because sometimes the OS cares, sometimes it doesn't. All right, so GDT of one is saying it's ring zero code. GDT of two is saying it's ring zero data. That kind of makes sense with what we did before with that, you know, printing out the segment registers. We had that table, and it said, you know, in user space we had like segment registers which had requested privilege levels of three and stuff like that, and our code segment was whatever, and our data segment was whatever. So if I take these values and I, I pull, I, I look at this sort of table, and if I go back to the, um, to a few slides ago, back when we were just kind of comparing, like this is what we saw, right? But the point is, anyone, you know, in user space can go ahead and print out what their current, you know, segment selector is in a segment register. But once you have the capability to go look at those data, at, at those actual descriptors, then you can say, what does it mean that CS is index three? in the GDT. What does that mean? What is the base of index 3? What is the limit of index 3? What is the privileges? What is the 32 versus 16 bit mode, et cetera? And so we can see here, code was index 1 in kernel, data was index 2, code was index 3 in user space, data was index 4. And so when we go back in and we have the capability to actually look at stuff, you know, we can, we can see basically the same thing here. They're code and data, they're execute and read, they're read write, et cetera. All right, so then we see there's another thing called TSS that we don't know about yet, but uh, that's going to be a system segment that we're going to learn about to a minimum degree possibly later. Then we see there's actually like a 16-bit segment in here. So there's 16-bit ring 3, got an empty one that's not being used, then we got some more TSSs, then we got a bunch of 16 bits, empty, empty, 32-bit TSS, and these other ones are also 32-bit. And then eventually we have just a bunch of empty descriptors. So this gives us a high level overview of what's going on with all of our segments. So at this point, now we can go ahead and once again drill down into each of them with the uh, uh, bang descriptor. Oh, well, one point I want to make first here, there is no LDT one, right? I said we can walk through the entire thing and there should be a specific system segment type of type GDT or LDT and uh, there isn't one. And I think I can prove that as well if I like go find the LDT register. There it is. LDT register. We said that's really just a 16-bit register, which is just a segment selector into the GDT. And it's set to zero. GDT entry zero is invalid. So it's definitely not using the LDT. <coughs> All right. So let's dig into uh, one or two of these quick. So if we do uh, bang descriptor GDT. And then let's say one. This is the kernel code segment. Okay, let's look at that. 
move this. Actually, we don't even need to send it to this lab, but whatever. If I move this over, here's what this plugin's telling me right now. It says, okay, GDT base equals 803F000. Where did it get that from? Anyone? Shout it out. Where did this plugin get that? Yes, the GDTR, right? So we got those, how do you find where the GDT base is? GDT register. Specifically the upper 32 bits. But, uh, all right, and then it says, okay, you asked me to look at index x1. And that descriptor is the actual linear address where that's stored is for, for you know, index 1 is 8003F008. How do we get that address? All right, we added 8 to the base, and why did we add 8 to the base? That's right. So each descriptor is 8 bytes, and we have index 1. Yes. And the linear address means that it's an address physical memory, not virtual, right? As far as you're concerned right now, yes. Later on, it's virtual. In reality, on this system right now, it is virtual. But we haven't learned about virtual memory yet, so it's just an address of physical memory as far as you're okay. It's like we got all this memory. We're like all the way up to 8, 0, 0, 0. Yep. No, but it is, a, it is a virtual memory address. Once you turn on paging, once you know about paging, it is a virtual address. All right, so then this right here is dumping out the literal eight bytes that are found at that location, the actual literal bytes of the descriptor in order. So this is the byte at 008, this is the byte at 009. So in order to interpret that, right, we've got, we know what the structure looks like, and we just need to remember that, you know, structures are, well, we just need to know what it says are the low order bits, right? So in this sort of picture, right, this right here is, you know, byte zero, this right here is byte 4, and so this is bit 0 of byte 0. So that means if I have hex FF, right, the least significant bit is considered this part of the segment limit, right? So these first two bytes, that's, uh, yeah, the first two bytes, which were, I believe, FF and FF, right, that's the lower order two bytes of this, you know, 20-bit segment limit. And then if I go to the next two bytes, those are the lower order bytes of the base address. So going back and looking at that, right? So if FF, FF are the bottom uh, two bytes of the limit, right? That works. And then 0000, zero, zero, zero are the bottom two bytes of the base address. And then, you know, for this up here, it gets a little more complex. And we've got to figure out which one is where and what things are where. But basically what that says is, if we added all the things together, it turns out this one, this one, this one, this one, and then, so these three, and then this one right here, are the total base address. And that base address is specifying zero. Right? And now the literal uh, 20 bits of um, limit are FF, FF. And it turns out it's like that F right there. So it's like five Fs in order to have uh, 20 bits. And so that's saying FFFF. Hold on a second. And this part right here is printing out the segment size is in four kilobyte pages. Where did it find that from? Anyone remember? Anyone on the phone? Where did it find the, uh, how does it know to tell me that it's four kilobyte pages at a time? Are you answering or no? Yep, answering. That's right, the bit. Don't know what it is, but there's a bit that says that. Yes, it's the G granularity thing. So it's saying, Granularity is for kilobyte. Yes, question. So, this is printing low to high? Yes. Here? Okay. Yep, so this is, it's saying at address 008 is this. At address 009 is that. So it's okay. just kind of in order. Okay. Yep, I agree though. It could obviously be interpreted either way. Yeah. All right, so then it tells us some other helpful things. You know, it looks at the DB bit and it says, okay, that's 32 bits because DB is set to 1. Uh, and then it says segment is present since it checked that P bit, the present bit. It says, okay, yes, it's present. And then it checked those two bits for the DPL and it says the DPL, those two bits are set to zero. So we consider this like a ring zero thing, right? We haven't said we're officially to saying that these are or aren't rings, but they are. Uh, and so DPL is zero, so this is like a ring zero code thing. The type is not a system segment. 
That means it's coder data. And specifically, it's a code segment. And it looks like I forgot to update this plugin to actually say in this mode that it's code read, write, or yeah, read, read, execute, read, and accessible, right? So it said it in this, in this part of the plugin. It said, yeah, hey, that's uh, execute, read, access. Right now, that's what the type is set to. Code, execute, read, access. But uh, I forgot to put that in here, so it looks like it just says it's code. All right, so and then segment is not conforming. So I said by default, non-conforming is the default. It means ring three can't jump in and start executing ring zero code. I guess this right here, segment is readable. It's telling you that it's readable. Ring is accessed, all right? And so like I said, when you put all of those bits together, you get a base address of zero, and you get a limit of FFFFFF in four kilobyte chunks. So that means functionally, you can go from zero to all Fs, right? So you take those and you add on another, you know, three for, for the maximum four kilobyte chunk goes zero to FFF, right? And therefore, altogether, he's saying this segment covers from zero to one less than like, two to the 32. So it covers all of them, right? So code segment for kernel covers all of memory. Let's quick look at the code segment, the data segment for kernel. That was index two, because we saw earlier that the data segment register, and actually, even if we want, we can in the, uh, in the registers window, if you go look at these actual literal values for the registers, like if we didn't even, if we hadn't even printed out the code segment and stack segment before, we could have went and said, okay, CS is eight. But, well, okay, sorry. Over to the board, uh, Bill, please. <coughs> right, so again, just a reminder, right, all segment registers are always holding segment selectors. Segment selectors are just a little 16-bit data structure that has three fields, which are like this. So if CS equals literal eight and it's 16 bits, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, uh, eight, yeah, CS holds literal eight right now, right? Mm -hmm. But since we know CS, like all the other segment registers, is really just a segment selector structure, we know that these few bits right there are the RPL, right? This bit right there is table indicator, right? That says whether I'm talking about the GDT or the LDT. These 13 bits right there are are the index. So even if we hadn't printed everything out there before, we could have went, oh, CS equals eight. We like drop the last three bits, shift it, you know, right by three bits. Oh, that's index one in the GDT. So I know that CS, the code segment, is pointing at index one, and SS, which is 16, would have been. Like that, right? Index two. So I can find my code and segment. I'm in the kernel right now. I'm in the kernel debugger. And if I want to say for me in my kernel right now, what segments am I using? I'd say ah, index one and index two. This is the GDT. So print out descriptor space GDT space two. Uh, back to uh, me, Bill. So. And we see a very similar looking thing. We see a different descriptor address because now we're indexed to eight bytes each, right? So two times eight, one zero. All right, we see the literal thing printed out again, but it actually looks uh, really similar here. In fact, the only thing that's different is this was 9B and this is 93. And you'd have to go, you know, look at, figure out which bits those are. Pretty sure it's the type. Okay. So this one is actually a data segment. And as we saw before in the summary view, it is a data read-write and it's accessed right now. So ES is pointing at a code segment, which is execute read. ES is pointing at data, or sorry, SS, sorry. SS is pointing at uh, data read-write access. And it also has a base address of zero and a limit of all of memory. 
So having investigated this, we now know that the kernel has one huge segment for code, starts at zero, goes to maximum FFFFFFF. Data starts at zero, goes to maximum FFFFFF. So for the earlier question about, you know, code, can segments overlap? Yes, they can overlap, as I said before. And in reality, they're always maximally overlapped in the kernel. Let's uh, just do a quick investigation about those other code and data for uh, user space. Okay, yep, looks like zero to FFF again. User space data, zero to FFF again. We do see that the DPL is three again, right? So the DPL changed in those. So the user space ones are also zero to four billion, right? So what this means is, functionally, the OS is not using segmentation for any sort of protection because if all of my, I think, and then someone else asked before, can you overlap, I think in the context of the previous overlap, it was like, you know, can you overlap so that things are treated as code and data? And the answer is yes. That's how it's always working, essentially. You're always just having one big blob of code, one big blob of data. And because of that, that's why you can, like, read in your code and, like, uh, write to your code and stuff like that. Because you shouldn't be able to write to your code based on segmentation permissions, right? You should not have self-modifying code if code was kept in a code segment and data was kept in a data segment, that code would be non-writable, right? Because you can't write to a code segment. But because they're completely overlapped and because, you know, CS and C DS and stuff, when you do that write to memory, it's implicitly using the stack segment selector, right? Because you're just writing some data to memory. And it just happens to be memory which is in the DS or SS segment, right? And uh, which happens to be in your code. Yes. Good face. I'm not trying to have a question so much as a, as a, as a, as a WTF. Yeah. Because um, it's simple. No. We'll, we'll talk about later um, reasons why this may be the case. But you can certainly see that it's simpler, right? You just have like one giant chunk of memory and you don't have to like split stuff up. Is this one of the things they started to fix in the later versions of Windows which are supposed to be better organized under the hood? Yes, basically, right? So if you know about the things like NX and stuff like that already, that's really just trying to get back what CS, what, you know, code segments had. Readable, executable, but non-writable, right? Segmentation already had that. But no one's using segmentation that way. You can always write to anything. You know, data can be executable, code can be writable, because it's just one big overlap. And when you write to data, it's, it, if they're all the same segments and they're all the same linear addresses and they're all the same logical addresses, you can write and execute anywhere. So makes it so that all of memory is read, write, execute. So later on, once that became a problem, uh, they were trying to get back to having, you know, finer granularity so that they can mark data as non executing yes. Uh, yes, it's currently the case that most Linux systems, FreeBSD, I haven't really checked the BSDs. I'll go out on the limb and say that I'm going to guess that most BSDs are doing the exact same thing. And yeah, we'll, we'll get into the speculation for that later. So that's what we uh, learned here. We can, you know, pull around of that. Remember the GDT descriptor, or this descriptor it can let you look at, like, LDT and stuff like that. But, you know, if we do descriptor dump LDT types, as we said, we already see that there is no LDT. So to just say LDT R is zero. It's unused. You may not show anything. So. Anyways, that's there for what it's worth. All right, so that was the point of the this lab was to get you a little bit of experience with Windows. We'll just leave this here for now, but also to get to the point of saying although Intel may have wanted you, they were trying to give operating system designers the capability to do this, right? So that you can break code up, you can break data up, and you got that data is actually stack, and this data is actually just regular data. You know, that stack one, maybe it's expanding down, it's not a picture, but let's pretend it was. That sort of thing, right? That's what they're trying to achieve, but that's not how people actually used it. Oh well. So that is the lab, and then do 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 do. So that is that, and this is this. Stop. One more time.
So at this point, we do know enough about to say, you know, some definitive things about what it means to be ring zero and ring three. Right? We've seen requested privilege level. That's something that's the least significant two bits in a segment selector. You know, those segment selectors are usually just in segment registers. Sometimes they're in things like the LDT register. Remember, that is actually just trying to select something other than GDT. We see RPL, which can be 0 to 3 and stuff like that. We see DPL inside the actual segment descriptor, right? So this describes a 0 to FFFF chunk of memory. And uh, that's considered ring 0. That's considered ring 3. And so the final thing we need to understand this is that the notion of current privilege level, whether I am right now in ring 0 or ring 3, that is defined as, well, the protection level of the current executing code segment. And what that means is whatever's in CS, whatever's in the bottom two bits of the segment selector in CS, that is whether you are in ring zero or ring three in terms of your capabilities. That's where, that's from whence all of the access control derives. So the OS, when it first loads up, when it first, you know, sets up segmentation and turns on, um, when it first sets up segmentation and it turns on protected mode, before it has that, it creates some segments, it sets some segment descriptors, and specifically it sets the first CS segment descriptor to have requested privilege level of zero. And that means when they say, okay, or sorry, you don't need actually paging to do that, but anyways, uh, they set, they're, they're basically an initially in a state where they're considered ring zero, right? But once they, once the OS is loaded, and they want to start, you know, deprivileging user space code. They want to let user space code run, but they don't want it, you know, messing up everything. What they have to do is when they, you know, con context switch into the user space code, they need to make sure that the CS register is set such that RPL equals three. Because if RPL is not equal to three, that user space code or user code is still going to be ring zero. Right? And so that's why back here, at the very beginning when we just printed stuff out in this sort of table. Okay, that's why CS had to be 3 there uh, for the RPL. Right? The literal value is whatever, but you take the bottom two bits and it's 3. And that's what says this code which is running in, you know, outside of the kernel, that's ring 3. But when it transitions into the kernel, uh, there's, you know, access control mechanisms and things like that that say, are you allowed to transfer to uh, CS, which has ring zero as set as the bottom two bits? Yes. So given that the memory completely overlaps, yep. that uh, current You're on the right level track. has to be the same as the descriptor uh, provision, or yeah, yeah, I don't know what key actually stands for. But privilege. Yeah, privilege. So. Is there anything whatsoever stopping me from looking at the address of something that I'm not allowed to get at via because it happens to be the kernel segment and just go to the same address in no. the user segment? Correct. Yeah. So she keyed on the key point here. We just said user space and kernel space segments cover all of memory all the time. It's all memory all the time. There is nothing inherent in this memory access portion which prevents ring free code from reading the stuff in ring zero, if you think of it like, you know, it goes zero, if you think of these linear addresses like they're just mapping directly to physical RAM, there's nothing stopping ring three from just saying, oh, well, my address is zero plus, you know, eight zero zero zero, and oh, that just happens to be kernel stuff, right? So technically, under these sort of systems, when you're covering all of memory, you absolutely should be able to go from user space to everything. And the reason why that's not the case is because of paging, right? So the only way they can get away with this, like, making big blobs of things is by having additional access controls in the paging, the virtual memory level permissions. Once you turn on virtual memory, that's where you can then start saying, no, no, this is my data, and my data is marked as supervisor level, and therefore ring three can't get it. Only one, two, or zero, one, or two can get it. So we'll talk about that when we get there, but yes, absolutely. Mega segments means no access control for memory access. What it does give you, though, is the things like privileged instructions, right? So ring three can still not set the GDT to whatever they want, IDT to whatever they want. Can't do any I.O. and stuff like that, depending on how that I.O. privilege level is set. So that's where the ring zero, ring three first, even when you have all of this, you know, completely overlapping memory, 
it's still, the hardware is still enforcing these, you know, can I jump to ring zero, can I jump to ring three, stuff like that. That is still enforced, uh, but, and actually that's a good point. You know, maybe some of the stuff like the inter-segment calls, jumps, and returns, they might still be, um, I don't think you'll probably be able to do that so you may be able to read the data, therefore, and not actually execute it. Because I don't think on the data access there's RPL, DPL kind of checks. But I'll have to check on that, actually. So now that I'm thinking about that, I may have been too strong in saying you can access anything everywhere. But I can test that by turning off paging sometime. What I can do. All right. But anyways, <coughs> so back to our hammer time slide. Right, so the point here is between the CPL, RPL, DPL, and stuff like that, uh, access control is automatically enforced by the hardware when you're trying to do something. Yeah, so I already said that. If you're trying to, for instance, do an inter-segment jump, uh, which means like, you know, when I'm in user space, I'm considered in, you know, segment, segment index three in the GDT, right? So I'm in segment three, and maybe I want to jump to segment one, for instance, right? That's kernel space, uh, this is where actually, this is one place where those access controls are enforced. So this is at least why I don't think you necessarily can get there via execution, but you maybe can probably still like read and write. So it's checking something like, if CPL is less than or equal to the descriptive privilege level, then I'll allow it. And so you can think of that like, you know, if my CPL is zero and I'm trying to, you know, jump into a ring three, uh, code, zero is less than or equal to ring three if the, you know, segment is described in its DPL inside of the segment descriptor. If it says, I'm a ring three segment, you know, the hardware will be doing these sort of checks where it says, is zero less than three? If so, go for it. You're more privileged. But, same point here, if you're in ring three and you're trying to jump into the ring zero one, right, your three is three less than zero, no, so access to not. But I don't think that is actually checked on data access process. I probably need to double check on that. All right. And then, yeah, so the main thing is, well, not necessarily the main thing, given that, but uh, an important point is just that there are some instructions where it just says in the manual, you must be CPL equals zero in order to do this. And what does that mean? It means if your bottom two bits of CS are not zero, you're not allowed to access this. Hardware says, no. Right? Try to execute instruction. Hardware checks, oh, what's your CS look like today? And as I said before, kernel is responsible so that the first time it lets some user space code run, it better have, you know, a segment which has DPL of three, and it better make sure that the CS gets updated to have an RPL of three, and it's pointing at, you know, a DPL of three in the segment so that everything access controlly works out there. Yes. Um, so you keep saying the hardware checks, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this or that, the checks the CPL. So does that mean every time you try to read or write, or at least write to memory. The CPU is going, pulling that chunk of memory, checking the CPU, checking your CPL, comparing. I, w I would say that yes, but keep obviously in, caching. Exactly. Keep in mind the caching that was there before. But yes, the point is, you know, it sounds like intensive and stuff like that, but in reality, remember, since we're just, you know, adding a little extra circuitry, and it can parallelize and go through that circuitry at the same time, right? So before you can get into the circuitry, which, you know, starts executing a specific instruction, it just has a little bit that says, pull from that register, pull from that register, do an and, you know, or whatever it's doing. Right. Check that bit, and then go for it. Yeah, I was just curious if that was what yes. happens was the performance. Yep, that's basically it. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the standard argument, right? Security versus performance. If you have that extra little few nanoseconds of every single memory access, the hardware has to propagate through some circuitry before it can get there. In I practice, guess. it's not a big deal. What? That's right. You can to some degree, but yeah, and then right, but then you have more complex primary search. Right. So if you want to parallelize it and start like executing the thing speculatively, <coughs> but oh wait, you know, it turns out that I actually need to kick that out because that wasn't allowed. That makes sense. Yeah, there are rules. Right, and so then, of course, you're saying, you know, well, if the CPL is just lower bits of CS, I'm just going to go ahead and move, you know, whatever, move 8 to CS, and therefore I will have, you know, 
Now my code segment will be ring zero and my, deep, my you know, CPL will be zero and I'll be ring zero. The answer is no. Uh, the move instruction, first of all, cannot be used to load the CS register. So you can just go ahead and like move SS and move DS and everything like that. But for the CS register, even in kernel space, there is no instruction to just do move value to CS register. That only the setting of CS register only happens through very controlled interfaces, which are the things like interrupts and stuff like that. So you can transition things through interrupts and transition things through intersegment jumps and stuff like that. Uh, but it's definitely not the case that you can just say, oh, I want to be ring zero. Even kernel can't say, I want to be ring zero now. The kernel starts as ring zero. Right? So the CPU, when it initializes back to its default states, you know, uh, the, um, the CS registers and stuff like that gets set to appropriate. You know, there's some initial segmentation as necessary. I assume it's just, you know, this is again where I don't know enough about real mode to say exactly what it is. But I'm assuming that, you know, the CPU starts in a state where there's some maximum 16-bit size thing, you know, whatever, one megabyte size thing. And then from there, code executing in that one megabyte segment has to set up new segments. But, you know, the key point would be that the uh, CPU is initialized. So you're in ring zero when you start the kernel. And then kernel has to do whatever it needs to do to stay ring zero and make sure that you know, it's correctly deprivileging the user space. So the question is about if you're executing a system call and he already has a notion that maybe that the vectors through the interrupts and stuff like that. Um, I think it's too early to say anything about that, but yeah, it's just too early for that. When we get to the interrupt descriptor table, there will be things that look somewhat similar to these uh, GDT descriptor table type things. And it's again just here's some data structure. And when I vector through this interrupt, it's allowed by this ring and it vectors to this segment. So there ends up being segment selectors with interrupts. So you can select, oh, this interrupt goes to that kernel segment. So that's how a controlled interface where it's like only whatever is set in the interrupt table, which you know can't be set by user space, only that can uh, change the DPL. So it's pretty much interrupts, all gates, and inner segment, uh, inner segment control flow like jumps and calls. Those are like only three or so ways that you can actually set CPL. Or CS register. And returns, like calls, jumps, and returns. So return, like the kernel may set something up and then you return into user space in order to actually set the thing. Alright, so first, oh, that was failed. Anyone have any questions on what we've learned so far about, um, right, so the overall tables, anything like that? We we covered the actual format of these. And we said that, you know, to uh, actually jump down to here since we already covered it, right? So the point is, surprise, we already saw this in the lab, right? Uh, this is more like uh, Intel says, you know, in the manual, oh, hey, but if you really don't want to, uh, you know, get everything all set up complex, here's the flat memory model, right? Instead of having a bunch of, you know, Overlapping, non-overlapping, completely separate segments, stack like that first complex picture. They say, oh yeah, but if you want, you can just go ahead and set, you know, everything to point at a code and a data descriptor that cover everything. Yes, that is how to do it. Oh, yes. Zeno, so. uh, Corey had a question. Uh, if you can't set up CS with MOV, how does the kernel set up user land process have to do with the lower privileges right. CS? Yeah, so that's uh, like I was just sort of saying, uh, because there's only like three or so ways that you can set CS, there are things like um, intersegment calls, jumps, or, or returns. And that's like a call instruction, but where you specify, I'm calling into this or that segment. And so when you do that, then essentially, you know, because you're you're doing an inner segment one, that's where. So let's say you're in. See, I'm not actually sure even at the moment which way that the kernel uses like for that initial deprivileging of code. Probably should look at it. I have a feeling it's just a quote return from either an interrupt it, where it, it pretends that it's returning from an interrupt or it pretends like it's returning from a call, but. Uh, Basically, in either calls or returns, let, let's pretend that it's it's doing an intersegment return. Do I have any pictures of this? Or should I skip to it? 
I do have the equivalent in the interrupt thing. All right. I'll, I'll skip ahead to this quick just to give a sense of things. All right, this has to do with interrupts, but we can pretend it's the exact same case for intersegment calls and returns. So we know that when you do a normal call, EIP automatically gets put onto the stack, right? When you do a intersegment call, so the point of the EIP is so that you can get back to wherever you came from, right? When you do an intersegment call, you've got to put some segment information there so you can get back to wherever you came from, right? So an intersegment call or an interrupt looks sort of like this. This is what gets stuck onto the stack. I don't know if it's E-flag. I don't think E-flag is actually there for just a call and return, but let's pretend it is. Point is, if you said like, I am in, you know, segment three, I'm user space code, and I want to jump to segment one, which is kernel code, you'd say, you know, call segment one, and then, uh, actually, I don't think even the 32-bit offset even matters, but let's see, call gate, that we're in a second. So you're calling to a different segment, and then automatically your EIP is going to get saved, but also your CS is going to get saved. And so that CS and the EIP is a logical address. So with these intersegment things, you're basically pushing a logical address onto the stack rather than just you know, pushing a 32-bit offset. Right? So that's why all of those other calls and returns and stuff are really just intra-segment calls and returns and stuff like that. Right? You only need to, you're not jumping out to someone else's segment and then needing to come back. You're just bouncing around inside the same mega 4 gigabyte segment. right? So you only need that 32-bit offset within the same segment to know where you came from, where you're going back to. So essentially, what I would expect happens with the kernel is that all it does is it sets up its stack like this. So it pushes a CS onto the stack, which is the CS of the user space code. It pushes the EIP of the stack, which is the EIP of you know, the runtime initialization code that runs before main. And then it you know, returns, and the, the you know, intersegment return or interrupt return just pops that stuff off the stack, puts it into the right register. But when it's doing that, there's that privilege level check. It says, are you allowed to interrupt return? Are you allowed to intersegment return? Only if you are returning from a current privilege level which is less than or uh, equal to the privilege level you're going to. So it all works out for the kernel because it's like I'm ring zero, I'm returning back to ring three, zero less than or equal to three. And so the hardware lets you set CS through this way. Right? So it doesn't let you just move, hey, I want to be you know, ring three now. You set something up and you pretend that you're returning to where you came from. It doesn't access control check and then it lets you go because, right, and that access control check is the key point there because otherwise user space could say, oh yeah, I was CS0. I was CS of, you know, 8, which is ring, ring 0 code, index 1. I was index 1 and now I was EIP, whatever kernel function. And okay, I want to interrupt return now into the kernel, right? But access control check by hardware at that point says, oh look, I see you're trying to return intersegment, but your CPL is three, which is not less than or equal to zero. Fail, you're not allowed to do it. So in answer to your question, that's basically how I'm expecting it works is the kernel sets up a stack, uses one of these allowable mechanisms. You know, there's, like I said, there's, there's three or so mechanisms that it can then uh, go return back to where it came from. I mean, it could call into the user space code. It really doesn't matter because that initial jumping to user space code, it's not like the user space code is expecting to return back to the kernel through that means. So the kernel could call into user space, the kernel could return into user space through intersegment, call or return, or it could use this interrupt return. We haven't learned about it yet. But still, I'm always up for aggression. Does that answer the question for it? <coughs> So this is the world uh, as we know it. This is some stuff I threw in here to help you out with the rootkits class later. So I guess I didn't say about it at the beginning, but when we have the rootkits class later, how I'm planning on running it is I'm going to distribute a VM that has a bunch of like proof of concept type rootkits in it, as many as I can get to run at the same time and actually persist across reboots, because some of them don't seem to be persisting across reboots, like they conflict with each other. So they'll, they'll install if I install them in the right order, but then if I read them, they don't work. Anyways, I'm going to distribute a VM and I'm going to say find all the rootkits you can find on here, right? Then we'll see who finds the most. So 
there's some in there which I know explicitly tools will not help you find. So I don't know how you're going to find them. Maybe you're going to do some cool forensic analysis and things, whatever. But this is a topic, hint, hint, which I threw into the Intermediate x86 class, which wasn't in there last year, uh, which is related to all the segmentation and stuff like that, um, which may or may not be related to rootkits. All right. <coughs> There's this thing called a call gate descriptor. It goes in the GDT. We're still talking about uh, GDT descriptors. Hey, don't write that down. You're supposed to forget. <laughs> <clears throat> I thought I added call gate descriptors to the plugin, but I didn't see it when I was doing this. So maybe this code is old and I did not build my code. I don't think I uploaded the new code. Oh, well. The descriptor plugin, I should eventually be uploading a version of the descriptor plugin which will parse this structure and just you know, tell you what's up with it. All right, call gates are a type of thing which is meant to be a way that the, the kernel exports a way for the user space to call into a very specific location in kernel space. So this is where user where is that right? Kernel space exports it for user space. So if kernel space <coughs> Kernel space wants to allow some API between user space and kernel space, as it usually does. Um, no, it is, it is right. Yeah. So for this call question from before, pay attention to this. If kernel space wants to export an interface between user space and kernel space, it can use something like a call gate descriptor, where it puts this thing in the GDT, and then people can use a call instruction. And they can specify, they can say call segment selector, and that segment selector selects from the GDT. And if that segment selector selects a call gate, then it'll go ahead, it'll do you know a DPL check and stuff like that. And it'll say, okay, well you can call this index, and this call gate is basically going to have two components, one a segment selector, and two a 32-bit offset. So it's basically the kernel setting this thing in the um, in the GDT, and it's saying, all right, so I want user space to call to one specific offset. I don't want them to just like jump anywhere into the kernel. They can call to this one location which I specify. And I'm going to, you know, put some kernel code there which handles whatever they're doing. Maybe they're passing me parameters, and I'm going to like have code there which checks their parameters and does something based on that. Call gates are the basis for your typical system call capability. So whether you're Unix, and Unix call it the system call table. Um, Windows, they call it the system service descriptor table. Previously, they were, inter they were uh, in implemented with interrupts. Nowadays, they're implemented with a separate instruction syscall, which we don't talk about. Um, I think it's going to be in the rootkit class. But the point here is kernel typically restricts it so that it's the only one who's allowed to access hardware, right? You don't want the user space go code going out there and you know, scribbling all over your video buffer. You don't want it, you know, scribbling all over your hard drive and stuff like that. So one of the many points of kernel space separation of user space, kernel space, and interprocess separation and all that, one of the many points is that the kernel wants to be the guy who's in charge of talking to the hardware, right? It will let many processes run in parallel and let them think that they're special and have, you know, exclusive use of the system. But when it gets time to start accessing hardware, for instance, the file system, you call a kernel function open file or whatever, right? That open file is exported from kernel to user space, and you know it's it's somewhere buried in a user space C library. It eventually you know gets down to the point where the user space library calls into the kernel and says, "Oh, the kernel exports this open file function." And then eventually, there's for instance an interrupt where on Linux you've maybe seen int 80 in the past. So interrupt hex 80 will call a specific call gate which then uh, allows the code to jump to a specific location in kernel, and that kernel thing says, okay, your parameters are, you know, EAX, EBX, ECX, whatever. They'll say, okay, if you put EAX equal to, you know, 52 or whatever, then I see that you want me to jump to the open file, and I'll, you know, I'll pull the, uh, the name of the file you want to open from one of your other parameters, whatever. So call gates are basically the way that the kernel says, you know, user space, you may jump to one specific location, you may pass some parameters, and then, you know, based on that, I'll go ahead and, you know, have some code at that location, and I will execute whatever you're asking for with this exported API. 
And so that's typically, you know, the core system API. I think on Windows, they, they called it the native API and stuff like that uh, because it's like the API the kernel exports. And when it comes all down to it, one way or the other, if you want to access the file system, you've got to go through the kernel. And it has this, you know, system service descriptor table to, to look at. All right, so getting into the actual details of this, it's, it's much simpler than the other ones. Really, the point, like I said, is there's a 32-bit uh, segment offset, and then there's a segment selector. So really, the bulk of it is a logical address, right? It's saying, I've got a logical address that points at the handler code for any system call, right? So if you want to call a system call, it's always pointing only at this location. You know, user space can't update the GDT. Therefore, the kernel sets it once. The user space calls to this gate using int 80, or on Windows, it used to be int 2e. On like Windows 2000 and earlier, you'll see int 2e, and that's how you're you're actually saying. Um, oh, see, I completely described it wrong. Well. It's actually using interrupts. Ah, yeah, it's actually using interrupts on this one. But very similar to interrupts is a call. <laughs> 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 yeah, the point they the point the reason they put in the call gate was so that you could do system call tables. But everyone ended up implementing them as interrupts instead. So, so spoiler alert, interrupt descriptors look very much like this. So is it the case that relatively modern OS is like Windows 7 are still using interrupts? No, there's, uh, there's new, more optimized uh, instructions that are dedicated to system calls, like they're called okay, like so that sys enter and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Right, so e after like Windows 2000, they stopped using interrupts. Okay. And they go to system call. It's like a dedicated instruction, syscall or syscenter. I don't remember which ones can tell which ones AMD. Anyway, so the point of the call descriptors was so that you could have these sort of interfaces between user space and kernel space. The kernel could set a call gate, and rather than doing, you know, an int 80, it would do like a uh, call to the segment select, call with a segment selector which selects the specific call gate. So it would just say, you know, call. Um, whatever, hex 20 or something like that. And that hex 20 would be used as a segment selector. You figure out the index, you point out a call gate. The hardware would say, OK, well, I see that this has a DPL of, let's say, 3. And it says, OK, this can be called by people who are ring 3. And if it's called by people who are ring 3, transfer to this segment. It's got a different segment selector. And that can point at ring 0 segment. And then this offset into that segment. So it's kind of a way to get from user space to kernel space to a very specific location, very controlled, right? So we said there's very controlled ways to get from one place to the other. Interrupts are one. Inner segment calls are another. And I'm trying to remember if there was actually a difference between inner segment calls. Yeah, there is a difference between inner segment calls and this. This is, yeah, so you can do inner segment calls. That's one thing. You can bounce around between different segments, but Normally, you know, you're not going to be able to intersegment call from, you know, a ring 3 one to a ring 0 one. This is a controlled interface that allows you to essentially do an intersegment call to a higher privilege ring. But it's only set up because the kernel is, you know, expecting specific, uh, specific inputs and it's going to only go to one location that's meant to handle those inputs. These aren't used, yes. But I still put them in there for no apparent reason. But how you actually call, let's see if I have it on the next slide, right like that. So I don't know if that instruction actually works or not. I feel like it does, but then I was having some weirdness. So I think it looks roughly like this. You say call F word, which is our pointer word, I guess. And so it's saying call F word pointer, and then you have a logical address for far pointer, logical address. And then it's got a far pointer, which is a segment selector which is 8, so it's saying, you know, I want to call. We, we know that there's not a call gate at index 8, so I should change that to something, whatever. Ring 8. All right, so really it's saying I'm going to call to segment index, you know, whatever 28 shifted by 3 is. So it's going to pull the in, the hardware is going to pull the index out of that 28 segment selector, go to that index. If it's a call gate, then it'll go ahead and check is the DPL uh, acceptable, you know, can this call gate be called by ring 3? Typically, you would only set up a call gate if you're trying to you know, let, or, you know, the point is maybe call gates are the way that you get from ring 0, or ring 3 to ring 1, 
and then from ring one to ring two, right? In the, you know, using all the rings case, maybe you want these very controlled interfaces like this, right? So that the only way you can get from ring three to ring two, from ring two to ring one, is through one tiny little, you know, peephole between the privileges, right? So this is basically how you call it. You can use inline assembly, F word pointer. You specify a segment uh, selector, which gets you to a call gate. And then this offset right here doesn't even matter. So this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, hardware doesn't care. Right? So it's just making you give a far, word, a far pointer. But in reality, it's all about the segment. Uh, I think the reason for this is because this can be like a call gate. Right? So I said before, you can call inner segment at the same privilege level. And that would look like the same way, right? You'd say, I want to call to that segment, but you know, I know that it's going to work because I'm the same privilege level. But in this case, if it sees that you know that segment turns out to, instead of just being you know some chunk of memory, if that segment turns out to be a call gate, then the hardware is going to do something else where uh, functionally this doesn't matter. So I think this is just a case where this is an overloaded uh, operator, right? You can call between segments, and you need a far pointer for sure for that. But if you're calling to a higher privilege, you don't need that, that offset in there because the offset is stored right here. You've only got one choice of offset, whatever the kernel set up for you. So that's basically how you can call uh, I think it would essentially be just, you know, when you write a C library for a given operating system, it's like, how does the library know that it's int 2 e versus int 80, right? The library, when written, you know, most of it's all the same for a normal C library, right? They could just say, here's all the x86 specific stuff. But when it comes to things like hardware access, right, you need to start knowing OS conventions. And the OS has to have somewhere where they say to library writers, hey, if you want to open files, here's how you do it. And somewhere deep down in their specification, the OS says, and you actually do it by calling int 80. You actually do it by calling to a call gate at index, you know, 28 or whatever. So it's really just an OS specific convention that would be set up and exported by the OS. But, uh, but that is pretty much everything. We're way over on our break, uh, but that is pretty much everything. We'll come back and we'll kind of describe why we're learning segmentation and stuff like that after, you know, after the re re revelation that, you know, all of memory is just one big segment. So it's read, write, execute was the point of it. Stay tuned. I'm going to break. <laughs>